So let me introduce today's speaker, which uh, is uh, Simon Knoyer from uh, TU Dresden. He will talk about network satisfaction for symmetric relation algebras. It's yours. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, so this is joint work with um, Manuel Budierski. And I would like to start with an uh, overview of what I um, will talk about. Um, so I will introduce a class of computational decision problems to you. They are called network satisfaction problems. And the result of our paper is a complexity dichotomy for this class. Um, so the way we obtained this result is by a connection to infinite domain CSPs. And I will show you this connection and also will give you some, some details of the proof. Uh, from the CSP side, what we used um, is, of course, so the universal algebraic approach to finite as well as infinite domain CSPs, and more precisely, a dichotomy theorem by Andre Bulatov for conservative CSPs from 2003. And more on the infinite domain side, we use a Ramsey type theorem by um, Hubich Kainos. Okay, let's start with an example of um, a problem in our class. And therefore consider a finite set of integers and think of them as distances. So one to five as distances in the plane. And now there's a computational problem that is um, given a graph, an undirected graph that is labeled by subsets of um, the set D. So for example, yeah, one, four, five at this edge here. And now the question is, um, can you choose for each edge a distance that is given in the, in the label set such that all triangle inequalities hold on all, um, all triangles of the graph? So what do I mean with triangle inequality? Of course, um, the label um, of an edge from A to B should, uh, A to C should be less than the label from A to B plus the label from B to C. And we think of them as distances. Yeah. Okay, what, how could this look like? Um, we choose this assignment here. And now we have to check are all uh, triangles, the, is, is the assignment for all triangles um, compatible with the triangle inequality? For example, here we have yeah, three, four, five. So all possible triangle inequalities um, hold, of course. Um, another triangle in our graph is this one. Also here, you can check, this is fine. But there's the last one, and this is um, this. Here we have, um, of course, that four is not less or equal than one plus two. So this was not a good choice of, of, of distances. And yeah, you can see that there's also no better choice. So this is instance we would reject now. Okay, so this was an example and more general. We can I, can I yeah. bother you with a, with a simple question? Yeah. Uh, do you also care about like longer cycles? So if you have no. a graph that has no triangles, then? Only, only the triangles, only the, the edges of, um, the, the induced triangles of edges. Okay, thanks. Um, so in general, um, we have this finite set D and um, so these triangle inequalities, we, we formalize now more general in a set B that consists of at most three element subsets of D. And now the problem, which is generalization of the example from before, network satisfaction problem of DB. Um, we have given an undirected graph G with edge labeled by subsets of D as before. And we ask, can we choose from each label an element such that now on each triangle, the three the set of the three elements is in b yeah so how now let's try to match this with the example d is the set of distance one to five and b are all subsets x y z of, of d where all trying all possible triangle inequalities hold and for the instance that we saw before we would now check okay for the first triangle three four five is in the set b as well as two, four, five is in the set B, but one, two, four is not in the set B. So in this sense, we reject this instance or we would reject this assignment. 
Okay, and now our result is for um, uh, classification of complexities for problems of that form. And the classification is that they are polynomial time tractable or NP complete. And additionally, we can given DB, so this, this tuple DB, these two data types, it's decidable which of the two cases um, holds. And of course, this means that there are no NP intermediate problems. And one could see this result as a partial solution to a question by Robin Hirsch. And he asked, can we point out all the P time tractable network satisfaction problems of relation algebras? And he called this problem the really big complexity problem. So of course, there's now the question, what have these network satisfaction problems of relation algebras to do with the class of problems that I introduced? And therefore, let me give you a very short um, intro to relation algebras. Um, they are basically sets of binary relations. So think of them as a finite set of possibly infinite binary relations that are closed under union intersection and the relational product, the binary relational product. Um, they are used to model temporal and spatial reasoning problems in AI. And some examples that you might know are Allen's interval algebra, point algebra, and read you connecting calculi like RCC5 and RCC8. Yeah. Uh, so the history of, of study of relation algebras started with Tarski and uh, some other names, Hodkinson, Maddox. But what, what's important for us is that every relation algebra has a well-defined network satisfaction problem, a computational problem that, that is called network satisfaction problem, um, a decision problem. And the complexities for um, such problems in this yeah, for, for, for relation algebras are only partially known. So only for some examples, like basically the names that I mentioned before. So Allen's interval algebra, point algebra, um, there are 18 small relation algebras. There the complexity is known and maybe interesting. There are also examples known for finite relation algebras with um, an undecidable network satisfaction problem. So it's not the case that we are always in NP for in general for network satisfaction problems. And in this sense, um, our result can be stated as a um, classification of network satisfaction problems of symmetric relation algebras with a flexible atom. So only for the context of the title and um, some motivation of this work. But um, this is all about relation algebras because um, we would like to see something about um, CSPs and therefore start with some basics for, for infinite domain CSPs. Um, and here we start with a set F of finite, um, uh, finite set F of finite relational tau structure. So tau is a finite relational signature and B is a possibly infinite um, tau structure. And then there's a class of finite tau structures, FOB of F, and these are all the finite tau structures that do not embed any um, of the structures from the set F. And for example, you can think that uh, F could be the K3, the, the complete graph on three nodes. Um, and then four of F would basically all finite graphs that do not embed and triangle, that do not have an induced triangle inside. Yeah, so as, as some example. On the other hand, H of B are all the finite house structures that embed into the possibly infinite structure B. And um, we call the structure B finitely bounded if there exists some finite set F such that H of B is equal to four of F. So we can describe the finite substructures of B by means of um, a finite set of forbidden structures. Um, yeah. Another important notion for um, infinite domain CSPs is homogeneity. And this is that every homomorphism of two finite substructures of B can be extend to an automorphism. So whenever you see two pieces that are isomorphic in your infinite structure, you can shift um, them um, by a global automorphism of the whole structure. And um, yeah, there's an important property for classes of finite structures, amalgamation property, that is in connection to homogeneity of the infinite structure. So but what, what's amalgamation? Um, for any three structures, A, B1, B2, 
such that A embeds into B1 and B2. So you can think of, um, we have two structures, B1 and B2, and they have a common overlap in the structure A. Then there exists another structure in your class, in this case, FORB of F, in FORB of F, such that um, um, you can embed B1 and B2 um, together in the structure C, and this behaves well with the structure A. So in formally, um, we have this commuting or this equality here. And now there's a connection um, between dimension connection between homogeneity and amalgamation property by Frasier's theorem. And we get that if a class FORP of F has amalgamation property, then there exists a unique countable structure such that the age of this structure um, is equal to FORP of F and the structure is homogeneous. And um, we will make use of this theorem. So, um, Therefore, yeah, CSP of an infinite structure are all finite structures that have an homomorphism to be. And um, the observation that we will use is that um, for every MSP, there exists a finitely bounded homogeneous structure such that the network satisfaction problem defined um, um, on, on, yeah, is equal to the CSP of this infinite structure. So this is basically the, the yeah, the, or of this motivation or this connection between, between network satisfaction problems and CSPs. So why is this? Um, how do we get this? We think of D, so D is yeah, the, the set of distances you can have in mind as a relational signature with binary symmetric symbols. So distance is symmetric and, and yeah, they are binary. And now we define the finite set of finite D structures um, as follows, uh, all two element structures with more than one non-empty relation. So all things like this, where you have two different distances um, between two nodes. So distance one and distance two, and all, yeah, also if you have three different distances and so on. Everything that is not exactly one distance. Um, and moreover, we have all the three element structures that induce a triangle that we don't like uh, yeah, in terms of the set B. So the, the labels are not in the set B. Yeah. Now, of course, whenever I write such a, such a picture and talk about um, now the D structure, so the signature is D, then with the picture, I mean that these two elements here are in the relation four. Yeah. And now um, the class four of F has the amalgamation property. And this is relatively easy to see because whenever you have such a diagram here, so two structures, B1 and B2 and something in common. And if you don't have a bad triangle, then it's fine to basically draw, take this structure that you see here as, as, the, as the amalgam. So you don't have to put new relations and um, this is fine um, to, to, to have to, some free amalgamation could um, be called this. And by Frasier's theorem, of course, we have an homogeneous structure B prime with um, A B prime is equal to four of F. So by yeah, applying the theorem. And as a last step, we extend B prime by all binary first order definable relations. So um, yeah, we take all the unions of the, the relations more or less of, of, of our signature D and extend our signature such that we have all, all of them in, in, in our signature. And now what's, um, why is the network satisfaction problem of D, this tuple DB basically the same as the CSP of the infinite structure B now up to some rewriting of signature. So start with an instance of the network satisfaction problem looks like this. And now we add um, new edges and new relations with a new symbol F. And this new symbol F means um, the two elements in the structure B um, are in no distance of the set D. So um, of course it could be, or it's, yeah, there are elements in the infinite structure B that are not in any of the relations named by the set D. And this new relation, so no distance is denoted by F. So free or flexible or whatever you, Want. And um, if you now change the, this point of view that 
the label on this edge means um, these two nodes are in relation to or for, then this is precisely um, a, 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 a structure in the same signature as B. And it holds that this is also in the CSP. So it's also an accepted instance if, if the former was accepted. Okay, and for the rest of the talk, I would like to call such structures B, such, such infinite structures B um, in the class FA for flexible atom or free amalgamation, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, that arise from such a data type DB as, as I told you um, in this observation. here. Okay, so now I can give you a second version of our result and always have in mind, so the, the infinite structure B has some, some yeah, is connected to this data DB. We will make use of this. And the, um, now we define a finite structure called the type structure of um, B or maybe also type structure of DB, one could say. And the domain of, of this finite structure is the set D together with two new symbols. And one of the symbols you already know, this is the symbol for the no distance relation in the structure B and a symbol it for identity. And we put in this finite structure, all finite, uh, all subsets as unary relations and internary relation where X, Y, Z is in H if um, one of the three options here holds. So first of all, um, the set X, Y, Z is a good set in our, in our data uh, set B. The second option would be um, the it element is not in the set, but f is there, and then we also have a, have a some some good tuple, and x y z is in h. And the last option is that there's um, uh, one identity element and um, only one other element at, at at most one other element. So this somehow um, models now a triangle where um, one one edge has an identity label, then um, the, the two other edges should be the, in the same relation. Yeah. But we'll make this um, clear in the following. And okay, of course, uh, Sigurds polymorphism for the finite structure D is a homomorphism from the six power into the structure itself with um, this identity here. And um, the second version of our theorem would be for every infinite structure in this class FA, so given by um, such tuples DB, then the CSP is polynomial time tractable if this type structure D of the structure B has a Sigurds polymorphism and otherwise it's empty complete. And okay, of course, the structure D is finite by definition and um, there are only finitely many homomorphisms from the six power. So you can decide whether D has a Sigurds polymorphism and this proves this more over part of, of our theorem that it's decidable which of the two cases um, holds given that this theorem is true. Okay, how do we get, um, how can we prove this? So B is in the class FA. And the first observation is that the CSP of the structure is an NP. So this is basically because B is finitely bounded for finitely bounded structures. You can guess relations that you have to add. And after guessing, you can check polynomially many uh, situations uh, if the bounds are there or not. And recall that we have only a finite set of bounds. So this is um, yeah, clearly um, checkable in polynomial time mode if you get. And the first non-trivial step is that um, for this finite type structure D, there's a polynomial time reduction from the CSP of B to the CSP of D. And of course, if this is true, then we can use the CSP dichotomy for, for finite domain CSPs. And if D has in Sigurds polymorphism, then um, the CSP of D is in P by the dichotomy. And in fact, we don't use the full strength of the dichotomy, but only for conservative finite domain CSPs. Um, of, okay, if we have a P time reduction, then this immediately implies that we have, um, that the CSP of B is also in P. So um, the second big step is that we assume that D does not have Sigurds polymorphism. And then also by the dichotomy, we get that the CSP of D is NP complete. 
And the main part of our work is to more or less prove that there's a reduction from the finite domain CSP to the infinite domain CSP. And this is um, with the help of Ramsey type theorems, as I mentioned by Hubitschka and Nestetrill and others. And then we would have that uh, infinite domain CSP is also empty complete. So let's have a look at the first, um, the easier case about tractable cases. And as before, um, we are in the same setting and recall the type structure. We have this domain, which is the set D together with these fresh symbols. And um, we claim that for B in the class FA, then there exists a polynomial time reduction from the CSP of B to the CSP of its type structure. And this is done by the following reduction. So this instance of the CSP of B, recall we, we added these, these new edges and labeled them by F and say these two do not have a distance. And now we reduce this. And so first of all, we add for each edge in this graph here, uh, new variable and uh, index correspond to which edge I mean, yeah? Then I put these red bubbles here for each triangle. So whenever the three edges now build a triangle, then they are in the, in the relation H. And of course we have four of them, yeah? And the last step is that we add for each uh, the, the, the relation of each edge here. So X2 and X3 are in the relation two or four. Um, and this is now a unary relation at this, um, this for, for this variable uh, two, three. And also for all the others, yeah, of course. And yeah, this reduction works and it's yeah, straightforward to, to do this like this. Okay, now the second um, step for this tractable cases is of course that we use the dichotomy and um, I will call a finite structure now conservative if all subsets of A are unary relations. So this may be not um, totally common to have um, this notion for structures, but of course compatible with the notion of conservativity for clones or algebras. And um, then of, by definition, the type structure D is conservative. Yeah, we, we put it all unary relations in this structure. And I would like to remark here that there already existed a notion of type structure introduced by Bodiski and Monte. And this finite type structure was used in exactly the same way we used our type structure for reducing the infinite domain CSP to the finite one. And yeah. In, 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 a, in a very nice way. But this um, finite type structure of Bodiski and Monte would not be conservative. And our type structure um, is conservative. And this is um, what we heavily will use in the hardness proof later. Okay, and of course, for conservative um, structures, we have the dichotomy now yeah, in this version here, so which is maybe not um, the, the original one. Um, but if we combine this with our reduction from before, then we have that um, if the type structure has an Seegers polymorphism, the CSP of B is in P. And this is everything for the algorithmic side of our result. Okay, so let's have a look at the second, the hard cases. So also here, I would like to start with some definitions and Therefore, okay, polymorphisms of B are all homomorphisms from the nth power of the structure into the structure itself for any n. And we call a polymorphism canonical if for all tuples x1 to xn from the structure B and all automorphisms alpha1 to alpha n, there exists another automorphism beta such that whenever you first shift the tuples x1 to xn by the automorphisms and then apply f, it's the same as if you apply f directly on the tuples and then shift it by the automorphism, okay? In other words, this means that a canonical function in, induces a, a function on an n-ary function on the set of orbits for all um, 
m orbits. So for all orbits of the automorph of the of the action of the automorphism group on n tuples of the structure B. Um, and there are some observations. So our structure B is homogeneous and um, only has uh, so all important relations are of area T2. And this means that um, we don't have to care about m orbits, but only care about two orbits. So orbits of tuples of length two. Another thing is that the two orbits can be identified with the set D star. So this is basically because yeah, this is the, the why we choose the set D star in this way. Um, so D star was the domain of our type structure and we have um, that all, all the elements there correspond to the relations, to the basic relations in the structure B. And in this way, we get a one-to-one -one correspondence of the orbits of the infinite structure and um, the elements of the finite structure D star. And most important, um, we have the following. If a uh, um, polymorphism of B is canonical, then this induced function on the orbits, which is an induced function on the set D star or an n array function on the set D star, is in fact a polymorphism of the type structure D. And this is also true in some sense in the other way, whenever you have a polymorphism of the type structure D, um, you find an infinite, an, an polymorphism of the infinite structure B that is canonical and that induces exactly the, the, the the finite operation or the, the operation on the finite domain um, with which you started. Okay, so um, last definition here. I would like to uh, weaken this uh, notion of canonicity a little bit. And this is for um, two elements A and B of D star. So basically two orbits of, of our structure. And then I call a polymorphism AB canonical if the same holds if we restrict ourselves to tuples x1 to xn from um, the set a or orbit a or b so this is not all orbits now but only two but also the same holds um, if we shift so we stay in the orbit by by a shifting of the automorphism and then apply f then this is the same if um, otherwise we would start with uh, applying directly on the tuples x1 to xn the operation f and then shifting with the automorphism beta. And now such an canonical AB canonical polymorphism does of course not induce an, an operation on all the orbits but on a subset of orbits on the subset AB of two orbits in this case. Um, and okay one thing that's important here that it really induces an operation on the set on this subset of orbits is because we are the structure B is closed under all binary first order definable relations. So the polymorphism that um, that preserves all these relations has to put in um, if all its inputs come from orbits A or B, then its output also is in the orbit A or in the orbit B because um, the relation uh, orbit A or, or orbit B is preserved by all polymorphisms. This is why this is really a function on, on, on a subset of two orbits. Okay, and um, now for another time, the conservative CSP dichotomy, but now more, more technical. Um, and we have that for finite conservative structure, then either there exist two elements um, in the domain such that all polymorphisms, um, the restriction of all polymorphisms on a b to the n is a projection and then np completeness or hardness follows. Or on the other side, um, pol of a has in Seger's operation as before. But what does this mean? Um, we are in the case that um, the polymorphisms of our type structure D do not contain in Seger's operation. And therefore we have that there exists by one two elements, A star and B star in D star, which is the domain of the type structure, su such that one um, is true. And this is now the starting point for our hardness proof. So all things 
that we collected now, so db, where our data is in, the infinite structure b, the finite structure d, and two elements from the domain of the, of the finite type structure um, that have this special property from, from before. And now the first step is that we prove that um, if B does not have a binary injective polymorphism, then the CSP is um, hard. And okay, this is basically what we would like to prove in general here in, in, on, in, in, this, in this part, um, in this hardness proof, but it's a little bit easier under this assumption. This is basically because the element it in, our, um, in the domain of the structure D is um, somehow independent of the data from db because we all in in all cases um, whenever you have another 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 db tuple you add the new element in the same way i mean the definition stays the same so only um, the second step is that if b does not have does have a binary injective polymorphism then it has a canonical binary injective polymorphism and for this step, we use the Ramsey theory. Um, next step, if uh, this implies that it, the element it, is not part of A star B star, because otherwise um, the induced function, um, if, if the polymorphism F is now canonical, then it induces a, a function on the orbits. And um, if it is on the other hand injective, this means that the induced function is symmetric for um, all, all subalgebras it x in, in D star. Because um, injectivity means whenever your input is it or x, the output is not it because this would contradict injectivity. Um, okay, so it is not here. And um, next step is that we show that if that B does not have an A star B star symmetric polymorphism. And by this, I mean an A star B star canonical. So it's not canonical in general, but canonical on, on the orbits A star B star. And the induced operation on A star B star, think of it as a partial function in, in, on the type structure, is symmetric, is binary symmetric. And again, here, um, there, there's heavily use of the Ramsey theorem. Um, step five, this implies that all polymorphisms of B are A star B star canonical. And if this holds for all polymorphisms, it's relatively easy to see that the CSP of B is then um, hard because there are not so many cases that can apply. And you can again use the Ramsey theorem and get that this would contradict your assumption about the elements A star B star in the type structure. So six is not, um, yeah, not, not very hard. But the most interesting um, um, step is so this um, number five. And this is what I would like to show you here um, for the rest of the talk. And in step five, we would like to prove this proposition. So you see step five here, um, four implies um, that all polymorphisms are A star B star canonical. So in other words, assume that B has an injective polymorphism and does not have an A star B star symmetric polymorphism. Then we get that all polymorphisms of B are A star B star canonical. Okay, and we start with um, the, the negation of two and the, 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 we use this lemma, which is um, inspired by by work of um, Budiski and Pinsker. And it says that when for all elements A, B in, our, in the domain of our type structure, or you can also think of A, B as two orbits, then B has an A, B symmetric polymorphism and the induced function on A, B uh, maps tuple A, B to A and B, A to A, of course. Um, this is equivalent to that every primitive positive formula, phi, um, that satisfies that has four free variables and it's satisfiable with um, uh, relation a on the first two variables and relation b on the second two as well as relation b on the first two and a on the second two then we get that phi also um, satisfy a on the first two and a on the second two okay and um okay 
Of course, we do, our assumption is that we do not have an A star B star symmetric polymorphism. Um, there are two options, a, not A star B star means not, not mapping both to A star and not ma ma mapping both to B star. So we get two formulae, um, phi A star and phi B star. And um, they have the properties that are mentioned here in two of the lemma. Okay, and now we use these two formulas, phi A star and phi B star to define a new formula phi. And this is done by the following. So um, in my picture, I denote um, yeah, variables are the, 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 the nodes here and the, the small edge is the relation F, the, the free relation, the flexible relation. Dotted line is um, A star and the full line is B star. We also have formula phi A star that um, is in four array formula or four free variables. And we know that it's possible to have this configuration. So A star in, in the, on the first two and B star on the second two. It's also possible to have B star on, on the first two and A star on the second two, but it's not possible by definition to have um, A star and A star on the first and second two. Okay, the same holds for the formula phi B star. This is possible, this is possible, but this is not possible. And now we build a new formula, phi, and this is done by the following. The three variables are the top and bottom, x1, x2, and y1, y2. And all the other points here are existentially quantified. And okay, the, the relations between, so the three variables are always relation f, but if we, um, define this in that way, then we have a nice property that if you start with a dotted, uh, with a full line here in the top, then by the green bubble here, we get that here, we don't, we, we cannot have the full line. So then in some sense, there needs to be the dotted line. And now we apply the red bubble and we get that um, there cannot be the dotted line. So there needs to be the, the full line. So we have full line here. And again, the green one, and we have that whenever you start here with the full line, you have the dotted line here. And this works also in the other direction. If you start here with the dotted line and you get by red, the full line, dotted and full. Okay, so we have full line if and only if dotted line here and also in the other way around. And um, the key thing here is that the relation F and um, the existence of an injective polymorphism ensure that this formula phi is really satisfiable. I mean, these implications always um, mean if if there is some tuple, then it has this property. But the main thing is, or, or the, the, the power of our setting here that we have this relation F and the injective polymorphism um, ensures that such tuples exist. This is important. And with this formula phi, we can now define a new formula EQ equivalence, which is also for array. And so this is straightforward. We get that um, we have on the first two um, coordinates, A star, if and only if there's A star on the second two coordinates, as well as B star, if and only if B star on the first and on the second. So this is now very, if, if you have to find, then this is easy to get. And what's also easy is that if such a relation is PP definable and therefore preserved by all polymorphisms, this means that all polymorphisms are A star, B star canonical. So you can take the, the um, preservation of this, of this relation also as a definition for, for A star, B star canonicity. Okay, and so this was all basically what I want to um, talk about, let me finish with last um, sentence. So our work um, also confirms the um, so-called infinite domain tractability conjecture about redux of finitely bounded homogeneous structures. The class FA is a small subclass of, of the, the class of all redux of finitely bounded homogeneous structures. And yeah, in this sense. And one thing that would be nice in the future, of course, classify more general classes of network satisfaction problems. And from the 
relation algebra motivation side this one possible option could be to drop the symmetry assumption so all our relations that we dealt with were symmetric and would be also interesting to have um, directed edges directed colored edges in some sense okay thank you for your attention yeah thanks uh, thanks uh, for a very nice talk the questions comments oh now you cannot see my screen anymore right no questions well maybe i can ask a question then yeah andre uh, so simon you you were mentioned in the beginning uh, some really big complexity problem um, as it was called by Hirsch. Well, it's, it's not uh, maybe immediate to everybody, uh, well, not immediate to me, why it's uh, so really big. Uh, could you say something about this? Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, so the, this, this question has different levels and um, there's one level that I would call not 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 very easy for for our infinite domain perspective and this is only a, a subclass of relation algebras where we already already don't know a, a classification so this is not the full problem of hirsch seems already yeah, relatively hard uh, uh, to solve with with our i would say advanced tools for infinite domain csps but in general yeah, there's, I don't know, there, in general, you cannot apply the, the infinite domain CSP um, um, stuff or, or theory. And there, I think there are no, no ideas how to do this in general, or if there is even a possible classification in some sense, I don't know, maybe. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It's just a hard problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe I will have a question as well. So you, at some point you compared your type structure to, to that of Antoine. So what is exactly the difference between the two? Um, so the, basically the arity of the tuples that you would take. So, so in, in the type structure of um, Manuel and Antoine, you would in our setting, since we have bounds of size three, so we forbid structures of size three, um, we would need to take um, tuples of size three and look at the orbit structure of these three tuples. And mm -hmm. of course, the, the conservativity only applies to the two tuples because mm -hmm. they are the part of our signature. And if you would have your, your type structure on three tuples, you are not longer conservative. And yeah. Okay. So, so it's like basically just you are restricting the, the RIT to two and that makes yeah, and and work. then um, you also have to um, be careful because um, if you have the higher arity, then you there's no need to have this relation age. You 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 can choose um, other relations that encode the the, the structure. The, so the 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 the, the, uh, the good finite structures in your infinite structure B. But if you are not on the three tuples, then you have to add something different to 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 yeah to ensure that this correspondence of polymorphisms holds so that the behavior of the canonical polymorphism is a polymorphism of the type structure and this is why there's no relation h in the type structure of Antoine and Manuel. Mm -hmm. okay thanks some more questions So, uh, sorry, so, so is it that the two types of type structures are essentially the same, like up to BP into definability or something, or what's, what's the exact situation? Up to BP into definability. Yeah, this might be. Yeah, I don't know, could be, but. I mean, I mean they, they should have the same. Same polymorphisms, right? So the polymorphisms are just the like two yeah, yeah, yeah. functions. Yeah. So and, and 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. If you go back to the canonical clone, then yeah, this might be true. Yeah. Another question? One last to ask, uh, one last opportunity to ask a question. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, so uh, does the ground theory of smooth approximation simplify things here? Or? Yeah, I think this um, is true. I think, um, so at least the first step, I, I mean, yes, the general feeling is that this should simplify um, most of this, um, but this is not not checked yet. But I think the maybe this first step in the hardness proof, so going to infinite, uh, going to the injective um, polymorphism. So okay, this is not really the theory of smooth approximations, but you can find find some nice um, lemmata in the paper and. There are definitely some things to to uh, do better and easier. And the, the general feeling is that the, yeah should be simplified. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I mean, in your case, you have uh, this unique interpolation, right? So like when, when you want to extend this clone homomorphism, say that you, you can just take some function which is interpolated by it, by some canonical function and consider yeah. the image, right? So yeah. But in your case, it's it's kind of happening in the sort of obvious way, right? Because I mean, you have the same behavior on that uh, two elements that that you already have the some behavior realized there. So. Okay. Yeah, so let's uh, thanks Simon uh, again.